Good morning, Stone Church. How you doing today? Yeah, happy Easter. I'm, I'm, I want to I try it out here. Uh, he is risen. He is risen and there's my church folk. All right. I love it. Uh, well, I'm excited for today. Uh, I don't know what you got planned next, but I'm just so thankful that you chose to spend time with us today, taking a little bit of your Easter to hang out with us. Uh, again, I don't know what you're doing. If you got... Uh, if you're going to eat or get some lunch or brunch, I guess that's all eating. Eating stays on my mind. That's my thing. Uh, I enjoy eating. Um, but uh, I'm excited for today. We're going to get into God's word here in just a second. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask for the next 20-ish minutes, if you'd be willing to just take a moment to unplug from the world. Unplug from all the stuff you got going on. Unplug from, from what you, what's, what's waiting for you out there. And just take, a, take some time here today to go, God, what are you speaking to my heart? Here's what I will tell you is that uh, I've already heard from other people as they've walked out. I've heard four or five different things that they've gotten from this message today. And all I can say is that is how God does things. God speaks through his word and he speaks to your heart. And that's, that's, that's so I'm going to ask you just take some time, God, what do you want me to hear? And I promise you if, you, if you're open to that, God will speak to your heart and he will, he will be able to touch things that maybe you didn't realize could even be touched or even point things out that maybe you didn't even know needed to be pointed out. Sound like a, sound like a plan? So I'm gonna jump in. We're gonna just go right into it. If you brought your Bibles, uh, you can pull up Luke 24. If you have a, a device and you wanna use that, you wanna use the version Bible, whatever. Uh, but if you're like me and you forget all those things, you can read on the screen behind me. Luke 24, starting in verse one, says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Amen. Remember how he told you while he, was, while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. I'm going I'm to tell you this, like, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read the Bible, um, I can look at the people in the Bible as characters, like a character from a book or a character from a movie. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, like, I, 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 I might spoil some things for you today, but Paul Blart, the security guard, he's not real. His name's Kevin James, and he's not like that guy at all. Uh, this one's going to kill people. I'm apologizing to everybody, but uh, SpongeBob, even the live action SpongeBob, not real. He's a character, right? We can do that same thing with people in the Bible. People in the Bible, we make them characters. We called them all growing up. Look at the Bible characters. Noah, he's a Bible character. No, 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 no. They're not Bible characters. They're Bible people. They're people like you and like me, people who roamed the earth, walked the earth, had emotions, felt the way you feel, had pain, have felt that pain. They're real people. And here's the truth is that today I hope that we can look at this narrative that we find in the Easter Sunday and we can look at it and go, maybe even the closest people to Jesus are a little bit more like us than we think. They struggle with some things. And hopefully we can find some hope and what they walked through and what God did through them. You know, first we see these, these young, these, these ladies, and what are they doing? This? They're, they're, they're going, now just kind of, I guess to kind of catch us up, uh, Friday would have been uh, what we call Good Friday, uh, but Friday is a day that Jesus has a trial. He is found guilty, even though he did nothing wrong. And from that, 
He has this long process. This long process leads him down this road where he has to go. He is whipped. He is whipped one lash short from dying. He is flogged, which means that they have just, just claw-like things that are going to rip his skin off of him. He has flesh being ripped off of him. He is going to then be nailed to a cross. He's going to hang. And while he's hanging there, he is going to suffocate and he's going to die. That's Friday. Sunday comes, and that's where we pick up here. You see, Sunday is the day that these ladies are going, and what are they bringing with them? They're bringing spices, these spices that they prepared, because what they were doing was they were preparing Jesus for his burial. They were preparing Jesus for the end, for his resting place forever. And when they get there, what happens is, is that, now number one is that, what I find interesting is, is that these ladies were going to go there, uh, and they were going to roll the, the stone away, but here's the thing, it would have been too heavy for them. They wouldn't have been able to do this. But isn't it funny how sometimes love can compel us to do things that don't make sense? And so they're going, and what, to their surprise, they get there, the stone's rolled away. Jesus is not there, and what happens is they see two men. These are angels. And these two angels tell them, why are you here? What are you looking for? He's not here. He's risen just like he said he was going to do. And in this moment, what we find is, we find that these ladies are living in a world that I would want to call maybe disbelief. They can't believe what's happening. How do I know that? Well, number one, it says that they wondered. They wondered what's going on. But also, they're bringing spices to prepare Jesus for burial. That's not something you would do. If you knew, wouldn't you, wouldn't you be counting down the days? All right, he told us. Now, here's the thing. Ten times in the gospel, Jesus tells the disciples, he tells the people closest to him, he tells them, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again. I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. So wouldn't you think that if, we really compre- if they really comprehended this, they would have went, man, okay, you know what? He died. That was gruesome. That was rough. But Sunday's coming. But we don't see that. What do we see them? We see them in this place of disbelief. Peter, I love Peter. Peter's a knucklehead. He's a lot like me. Peter just runs into this place and he, he, and he, he walks away and he can't figure it out. He, it makes zero sense to him what's going on. He's not here. What's going on? Disbelief. Because the truth is, if we really put ourselves in that place, it would make a lot of sense. Because they were also there when Jesus was being beaten. They were also there when Jesus was hanging and breathed his last breath. They saw Jesus dying. So it makes sense that they would go, we saw him die. But isn't it true that our brains can sometimes tell us things that we think, but they're really not the true thing that we should think? I want to do a little experiment. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to show some images on the screen. One of them is correct. One of them is wrong. And what you're going to do if you think that on the left side, if that's, if that's the correct image, I want you to put your left hand up. If it's the right side, I want you to put your right hand up. Easy enough? All right, here is the first image. What is right? Is it Oscar Mayer or Oscar Mayer? Is it Oscar Mayer with an E or Oscar Mayer with an A? You ready for it? It is Oscar Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. Oscar Mayer. Your brain told you that it was the other one because that's what we've always... How about this one? Okay, that, was, that, was, that one's a little rough. All right. Is it Cheez-Its or Cheez-It? Cheez-Its or Cheez-It? Cheez-Its or Cheez-It? It is... Keep those hands up. Don't you try and take back what you think. It is cheese it. Cheese it. Cheese it. All right. How about the next one? What's the next one? Ladies, guys have no clue what this is, so ladies, we'll go with you. Is it Febreze with two E's or is it Febreze with one E? Febreze with two E's, Febreze with one E. It is... Febreze with one E. With one E. And I've already been told I'm going home to check. So if you go home and you check and I'm wrong, 
email me and let me know at Jeff Dushman at stonechurch.us. All right, what's the next one here? Fruit Loops. Is it Fruit Loops or Fruit Loops? Fruit Loops or Fruit Loops? Which one is it? it was it two O's or with the regular spelling? It is two O's, two O's, two O's. And our last one here, our last one here, Kit Kat. Is it Kit Kat with a hyphen or Kit Kat without a hyphen? Who says Kit Kat with a hyphen? Kit Kat without the hyphen. It is Kit Kat with out the hyphen. Isn't that funny how our brains can tell us something that isn't true? Almost like this for my Star Wars friends. It's not Luke, I am your father. It's no, I am your father. You see, our brains can, we call it the Mandela effect, but the reality is, is that our brains can do this. What's happening here is that these ladies cannot believe, the disciples cannot believe that Jesus isn't there, but Jesus has told them time and time and time again what's gonna happen. Praise Jesus that he is who he says he is. So how does Jesus meet them in this place? Well, when it comes to disbelief, what, what God has done is he has allowed us to have his words speak to us. This is what happens, is that Jesus, when he's in this moment, Jesus, um, it, he points them to Jesus and encourages them to, reward, uh, to remember what he has said. There's some... There's some uh, I am verses in the Bible that we find that Jesus says about himself. One of those is, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. You want to live a full life, a vibrant life? Give your life to Jesus because he is the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Can I tell you this much? You want to go to heaven? The only way is through Jesus. That's it. I am the resurrection and the life, meaning we have hope no matter what we are walking through. Can I tell you? I know people are walking through some stuff. You're walking through some stuff. It's not fair. It's not fair what you're going through. But I can tell you there's still hope when we find it in Jesus. Jesus gives us all we need. And lastly, he says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Now, I'm not like NASA certified astronaut. But you know what I do know? That when I go into space, if I ever do, there's going to be no gravity. And I know that if I do accidentally, because it would be me to be the one who got out of the ship without being attached to the ship, that I float away. If I got too close to the sun, I would burn up. If I got too far away, I would freeze to death. That's why NASA has the astronauts tethered to the spacecraft. See, here's the, here's the reality is, is that astronauts have to be because that's where their air is coming from. That's where their life is coming they, they cannot be untethered. If they become untethered, bad things happen. But when they are tethered to the source of life for them, they can do amazing things, and there's a lot of cool stuff that they're able to do. The same is true for you and for me when we are tethered to the source of life. His name is Jesus. He is the true vine. We have an opportunity to be tethered to Jesus. In your disbelief, his word will be all the comfort you need. I know that sounds cliche. I know that it sounds like not true, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. It's true. I know because I've lived it my life. I have to hear what he says about me and his word. I, I tell people all the time, the Bible is just a 66 book love letter written to you. That's what it is. Then what happens is, is that we leave this place and there's a, uh, there's a few guys that are walking down this road. And this road, they're going to, uh, to Emmaus. So this is called the road to Emmaus. When you, when you find it in your Bible, it's called the road to Emmaus. And what's happening in the road to Emmaus is, is that these two guys are hanging out. And they are just, it's just in their mind, they are so discouraged. They're so discouraged because what happens is, is that Jesus shows up. They can't, they don't really notice him. They don't really like, they don't put two and two together that, hey, that's Jesus, that looks like Jesus. And it got me thinking, like, I'm a, I love watching like late night television. Um, I like Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon, he's one of my favorites. Like, I like all the stuff he does. And one of the things that he did was he actually uh, 
will dress up and go in a subway with a famous artist and they'll play music like, I think they're called buskers, I think is what they're called, but they'll, like, they're, they're trying to play for, for change, right? And if you don't know, Jimmy Fallon is the guy in the middle and then on his right is Adam Levine from Maroon 5. And they're singing and they're doing all that stuff. And that's, that is Maroon 5. So the other guy on the other side is that guy. That's the only one I know. That's the only one anyone knows from Maroon 5. That's Adam Levine. That's it. But maybe you're like, you know what, Matt? Like, they're dressed up. Like, you, of course, people aren't going to be able to tell. Okay? So another one that they did was you have this guy over here. He's a super fan of the New York Yankees wearing the jersey and he's being interviewed by this guy who is Aaron Judge who is a superstar Yankee and he's interviewing him about Aaron Judge and this guy's answering all of the questions about Aaron Judge not realizing he's talking to Aaron Judge and then this is the moment right here where it hits him oh man I'm talking to Aaron Judge like, it can happen where you don't even realize that you're talking to somebody that you're talking to that you don't even realize that's the person you're talking to. I confuse myself on that one. <laughs> These guys, are, they don't realize what's going on. And, and, and Jesus goes, what's going on, guys? And he goes, oh, man, like, bro, are you the only one who doesn't know? Like, Jesus, the Messiah, he died, and he was supposed to overthrow the government. He was supposed to overthrow, he was supposed to save Israel, and not, it didn't happen that way. Like, how do you not know this? And then Jesus reveals himself. And what does Jesus do? Jesus points them to fulfill prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is a prediction of things to come. And he tells them about these things called messianic prophecies. A messianic prophecy is prophecies, predictions about the coming Messiah that we find in the Old Testament. Now, what I love is how God meets these, these men in this place right where they are. And the way that he does that is that the, he actually meets them where they are and he reminds them that Jesus does what he says he will do. Can I tell you that today? Jesus does what he says he will do. What I find interesting about this is, is you know, it got me thinking about, I, I've, I've said this before, but it's this guy by the name of Peter Stoner. He's a, he's a professor at a Christian college. And him and his group of people, they, or his, his group of students, they tried to figure out, um, he wanted to figure out this probability. What is a probability? A probability is like if I had nine red balls and I put them in a bag and then one green ball in a bag, the chances of me grabbing that green ball are one in ten. Right? We put 10 in. So that's a probability. And so he wanted to figure out what would be the probability of the messianic prophecies coming true through one man. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that Jesus, we know, has, through Scripture, we know has fulfilled 322 prophecies. We can look at Scripture and look what Jesus has done and go, he has fulfilled 322 but what Peter Stoner wanted to do was he wanted to go, let's not, we can't, that's really, that's a lot of numbers there if we're trying to figure out that. Let's just break it down to eight. And then he goes, you know, there's going to be some skeptics who will go, well, you're just using the Bible. So we need, we need, we need to, to make sure that the eight prophecies that we're going to use, those eight prophecies are corroborated more than just scripture, but history can prove it too. So they used prophecies like where Jesus was born where he would die, how he would die. Eight prophecies that they, that they figured out, and they go, what would be the probability of one man fulfilling eight prophecies? And the number that they came up with was one in 10 to the 17th power. That means one in 10 with 17 zeros after it. And if you're like me, you go, I don't get it. And he understood that not all of us think Mathematically, we have to see it and visualize it. So they figured out what would be, how could we explain that? What would be the problem? And so what they did was they said, take the state of Texas. And what we're going to do with the state of Texas is, is that we're going to fill the state of Texas up on the ground. We're going to put uh, silver dollars and we're going to line them next to each other, filling the entire state of Texas. Not only are we going to do that, we're going we're to put them ten feet or two feet high. 
So we're gonna stack them two feet high. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put an X on one of those silver dollars and we're gonna drop it somewhere in Texas. And then we're gonna swirl it all up. And then we're gonna have somebody drop one person in Texas and let them walk wherever they wanna walk, wherever they wanna go. And the probability of them one time picking up that coin is one in 10 to the 17th power. This is why I believe that our God is who he says he is. The Bible proves it and history proves it. Our American culture will try and tell us that no, no, it's just the Bible, but here's the reality. The world knows, the world knows that these truths, they might not believe that Jesus is God, but they do believe that Jesus the man walked this earth, that he died and he was crucified. This is, a belief, this, is, this is a true belief. So then they go, well, what would be the probability of Jesus fulfilling all 322, just one man? Well, that number is a little bit higher. It's one in 84 with 100 zeros after it. We know that Jesus did 320. This is why we can trust our God. This is why we can believe that Jesus is who he says he is. In our disbelief, he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he will do. And the Bible says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Can I tell you something? Maybe right now you're going through it. Maybe right now you're feeling it. Maybe right now it doesn't feel Maybe right now you're going, I thought I'd be so much further, on, further along than I am. I thought I'd be so... May, I don't know what you're walking through right now, but what I do know is, is I know the one who's walking with you. And the one who wants you to know he loves you. And he's there for you. And he died for you. And he rose for you. That's who he is. And then we're going to finish with this right here. Luke 24, verses 36 to 39. It says, while they were still talking, this is uh, Jesus and the men, about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Like I've been seeing the trends of like teenagers getting piercings. Everywhere. You got the bull ring. You got the, like I saw someone had it, had it right here. Weird. But you know what? I've never seen a piercing in the wrists or the feet. So this isn't a fashion statement. Jesus wasn't trying to show how cool he was. You know what he was doing? You know what he was doing? In, in this moment, these men are filled with Doubt. They're filled with doubt. Do we just see a go what, what's going on? And he goes, you want to know what's going on? Look. This is what's going on. In the middle of their doubt, Jesus gives them evidence of who he is and what he's done. Can I tell you something? That evidence might work for some. I think it's kind of cool. A couple of professors have some quotes that I think will help some of us. Thomas Arnold, a professor of history at Oxford, said, No one fact in the history of mankind is proved by better and fuller evidence than the fact that Christ died and rose from the dead. Dr. Simon Greenleaf, and he's the one, he helped, uh, he helped uh, develop Harvard Law School. He said, according to the laws of legal evidence used in courts of law, there is more evidence for the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than for just about any other event in history. Jesus will prove time and time again. He will give us evidence in our lives. He will show us. With these men, what does he do? He shows them. We see with Thomas, he shows him. And here's the reality. Many of us in this room, you've walked this road of doubt that it doesn't look the way it's supposed to look. And why would God allow those things to happen? And here's the truth. When we hear those quotes, it's going to hit the brain. That's brain knowledge. 
I needed someone to tell me that. And there's some of you in this room that work for you. Oh man, a professor of law, if a Harvard law, come on. That's all I needed. But if you're like me and just a bunch of knuckleheads that don't have the highest IQ, I need to see it. I need to feel it. I need you to show me, God. I can't do this. I don't, just because someone said, I need to see it, God. You know, I haven't told my, my, my whole story in a while. and <clears throat> I felt like Easter Sunday would be the best time to share this. Because God, he proved it for me. You know, we grew up and we would say that we were a, a Christian family and you know, I went to church, usually with my grandma, but my parents, and but we like sports, all the stuff. But I remember at 13 years old, my mom and my dad got a divorce. And I was with my mom, and it was it was rough because I was, like I said, a knucklehead, but I was a like a bad knucklehead. Like I was one that knew it all and you couldn't tell me nothing, I was disobedient. And my mom tried the best that she possibly could with me. But she had enough, and it got to a place where she, she went and took me to my dad's house and said, I need you to take him. I can't, do, I can't do this. And my mom, again, she tried everything. She's in the room right now. My mom tried everything she could, but you know what? That was a scar. I'm older now, so I get it. But in that moment at 13 years old, that was a, a slash of rejection in my life. So I moved in with my dad. And when I moved in with my dad, I remember we went on a walk. Like I remember it so vividly. And we're on this walk together and we're walking. And in his mind, he's talking to a friend, not to his 13-year-old son, which as dads, we know that's not an option. You can't talk to your 13-year-old son the same way you would talk to a friend. But my dad did in that moment because he was hurt. And I remember my dad telling me, Matt, if you were never born, all the issues in my life would never be. It's your fault. He might not have said that exactly, but that's what I felt. Another scar. And I remember saying, forget God. I want nothing to do with God. If he's a good God, then why would that happen to me? God, forget you. I hate you, God. I hate you. And I remember growing up with that mentality. I hate God. and I, But the pain was still there. The pain never went away. The scars never went away. And I remember trying to fill every scar, every hole in my heart with something else. Alcohol, drugs, girl, whatever I could, people, friends, you find, we can find all kinds of things. But here's the thing they were all temporary and it never satisfied. I started dating a girl and I thought it was, this was the one. High school love, we all know how that turns out. She broke up with me, duh. But I remember her so bad. Rejection again. So I came up with a plan. I was going to get a gun. For the sake of ears in the room, you know the rest. My life was done. But I remember too, sitting in this room thinking this whole thing through, that tomorrow this is going to be the day. My life's not worth it. I'm not worth it. But this small little voice in my head said, you know what? You need to, I live four hours away. You need to drive home to Yakima to go see your mom and tell her that you love her and goodbye. See, the, the Bible is pretty clear that there's a still small voice, and that's Jesus. See, God was speaking to me. 
I came home and I remember I had, there was two guys that wanted to hang out with me. One guy wanted a party and the other guy had been radically saved and wanted to invite me to church. And I chose the right thing. I chose to go party. I want nothing to do with God. I want nothing to do with him. I doubt he's even real. And in the middle of partying, I kept getting calls from my friend who had given his life to Jesus, inviting me to church. And he called so much, it got annoying. And I'm like, bro, stop calling. I'll go to church with you if you just stop calling. So I went to church. And when I was at church, I remember the pastor preaching. He was saying words. What he was saying, I don't know. To be honest with you, I was just there to check a box, like get this guy off my back. I don't know what he said. I was honestly thinking about going and drinking afterwards. That was my thought. But then we got to the end and I was sitting in the back and we got to the very end and he goes, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. But there's someone in this room or multiple people in this room that you have felt like you're not good enough, you've been rejected, and you've been trying to fill holes in your soul, in your heart, with everything, and it's not working. I want to tell you the only thing that can fill those holes is Jesus. And I heard that. And he goes, if you would like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight and have all those holes filled, all that pain filled. You'll no longer have to numb it. You'll no longer have to try and figure it out on your own. He'll walk with you. If that's you, would you raise your hand on the count of three? And he counted to three and I raised my hand. He said, if you're bold enough now, the next thing I would like for you to do is if you're committed to this thing and you would you stand up? No one looking around, would you stand up? I stood up. And he goes, now what I want you to do is with everybody looking around and everybody standing with you and everybody looking around, eyes open, I want you to walk to the front so I can pray for you. And I said, nice try. We're not doing that one. I'm not doing that. You see, I was in the aisle, and I remember being in the aisle, and I felt from behind me, I felt this push. And I turned around, and no one's there. And I just knew this was my time. This was my moment. I don't know what's at the end of this, but I know that I'm supposed to walk forward. I know that. This, and as I took a step, I felt rejection being ripped off of me. I took another step. I felt addiction being ripped off of me. A next step that I have purpose, that God had a plan for me. And I step forward and I get all the way to the front. And what I realized was, is that Jesus was on a cross, fully stripped. And here's why he was stripped, so that we could be stripped from everything we're holding on to. Jesus, in the greatest act of love, gave his life. And in the middle of doubt, I finally, for the first time in my life, felt true love, true acceptance, and true joy. But it was overwhelming. And I got to the front, and I just got on my knees. I was so overwhelmed. I was so overwhelmed with love, Jesus. Ten minutes ago, I hated you, but he never stopped loving me. And I couldn't think of anything to say except for one word. Jesus. And I just said, Jesus, over and over. My life was, was, was miraculously saved by the guy that's what he does 
The problem with our world is that we think that he's some mean, vindictive God. But no, he's the complete opposite. He's a loving, gracious God who came to earth. And in that, he had this this amazing act of love. And he went to the cross and he died. And then to prove he is who he says he is, he rose again. And that's what we celebrate today. Because his risen body means life. And when life comes, that means you and I get to live. And here's what I want to tell you today. You might be in that place, but God is telling you, live. Live. The greatest day in history was an empty tomb. Today, for some of you, the best decision you can make, I'm going to give you an opportunity to choose. Here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. I'm not going to ask you to come forward like that jerk. (laughs) But if today you would say, Matt, I feel you. That story rings true. Parts of your story ring true. Matt, my, my story is not like that, but I understand where you're at. I've been trying to fill voids in my life. Today, I want to tell you, the only thing that can fill that void is Jesus. And I want to give you an opportunity to receive his free gift of salvation. Today, if that's you, I'm going to count to three. And on three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. By raising your hand, no one's looking around. It gives me who, it lets me know who I'm praying for but it also is a commitment by you to God saying, God, I'm committed to this. I need you and I want you. One, hands are already up. Two, three. Praise Jesus. You can put your hands down. I'm gonna gonna pray, but here's what I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask that you, everybody in the room will pray with me. But those who raise your hand, you raise your hand, I want you to mean it. And I want you to know that at the end of this, at the end of this prayer, salvation will come in your heart. Can we say this together? Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. My sin nailed you to that cross. God, come into my heart. Be the Savior of my life. Walk with me. Talk with me. Show me your love. I believe that you died on that cross. And three days later, you rose. Be my Savior. In your name, amen. Can I tell you something? The Bible's clear. It says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, that he died, and three days later he rose, you will be saved saved. I don't want to lie to you, though. I don't want to come up here and say, man, here's the thing. It's the best decision you ever make. But I don't want to leave it at it's the best decision you ever make. And you know what? From here on out, it's going to be rainbows and blue skies. If I did that, I'd be lying to you. It's the best decision you'll ever make, but it also can become one of the most difficult things you'll walk through. Because I promise you this, that tomorrow, not everything goes away. For me, addiction went away right there. I've never dealt with addiction again. To alcohol or drugs, ever again. But it doesn't mean that my heart hasn't been hurt. Doesn't mean that I haven't allowed things, people, words. Doesn't mean that I haven't thought or done bad things. It doesn't just get better right away but it gets worth it because now you're walking with him he's walking with you the the thing I love about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit also convicts and it helps us to know when we're doing something we shouldn't do or about to do something this is who he is and this is what he does he saves us and on Easter Sunday you just made the best decision of your life You just made the greatest decision, and here's what I know. Your name 
is written in heaven. And even more than that, there's a party going on in heaven right now for you. Probably playing some Justin Bieber. I don't know. There's a party going for, on for you because there's another one. We took another one out of hell. And here's what I know. I just want to make heaven crowded. I want it to be where I'm sweating all over everybody. So here's what I'm going to ask. We're going to finish today with this. Can I just have everybody stand? And we're going to worship. Can we just worship with our hearts abandoned, knowing that we serve the Savior?